So good morning, everybody. I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer of Emory Executive Education at Goizueta Business School. Thank you for joining us today for the continuation of our Business Over Breakfast series. And today's topic, communicating the right way, and that would be W-R-I-T-E. During the month of August, we are focusing on several facets of leadership communication. This is something that can be particularly tricky given so many of us are working physically distanced. Today, I'm pleased to have Dr. Steve Shepard with us, and I'm going to read his bio a little bit. Um, it makes me feel a little, uh, well, I wonder whether what I've done with my life when I read this. But anyway, Steve, <laughs> regardless, Steve is uh, what many have described as a modern day Renaissance man. Uh, he frequently teaches on reverse engineering the future which is maybe something we should uh, have you come and talk about too, Steve. He's a global citizen, having worked, written, and photographed in more than 90 countries. He is a National Geographic published photographer, uh, musician, technologist, master storyteller, and published author, including his most recent book of the same name as today's webinar. One of Steve's several degrees is in Romance Philology, which is the study of the structure, historical development and relationship of language. So he's, uh, we've just had a fascinating conversation about words uh, before this webinar started. Our goal today, as with all our Business Over Breakfast webinars, is to provide relevant ideas and information to help us all navigate through the uncertain and murky waters uh, created by COVID-19 especially when we're all homebound, juggling multiple priorities, working fast, it's often challenging to write thoughtful um, communications, written communications. Our hope is that through webinars like this one, along with other learning initiatives that we are offering uh, as, as part of Emory Executive Education, that we as leaders and professionals can better position ourselves, our teams and our businesses to not only survive and remain viable during this time, but to thrive as we emerge into the next normal. To this end, Steve will spend about 30 to 35 minutes sharing practical insights on building um, and, and writing uh, good communications. This will be followed by about 20 to 25 minutes of Q&A time. So please, I invite you to put your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen and our team will do their best to um, get as many of those answered for you as possible. At the end of today's session, there will be a very short five question survey that we would really appreciate you filling in because uh, that helps us determine uh, what is most relevant, uh, relevant to you at this time. So enjoy the morning with Steve. I look forward to continuing the conversation next Thursday when we focus on our next leadership communication topic. Uh, which is humor in the workplace. And uh, some days we need a little more humor than others. So I look forward to, uh, forward to this morning and also look forward to having you join us uh, next week. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Nicola. I really appreciate that. And thanks to the team for putting this whole thing together. And folks, thanks to you for joining us today. This is uh, hopefully going to be uh, a little bit entertaining for you and hopefully useful as well. I'm broadcasting to you, I feel like a television star here, broadcasting to you from my office in, uh, in beautiful Vermont, um, where, I, where I live. And today we're going to talk about this kind of concept, if you will, of um, writing in the workplace and the need for it. You know, all of us have noticed that as we have transitioned to things like Zoom and WebEx and other tools for communicating with each other, uh, we're all starting to look a little bit ragged around the edges as our hair has gotten a little bit too long and we become increasingly casual. And one of the things we have to be careful of is that sometimes so does our business writing. So I want to talk a little bit about that today. So what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is I'd like to ask you to just take a moment and uh, write for me in the chat window a little bit about your biggest challenge with business writing. Now, business writing takes on a lot of forms, email, white papers, blogs, you know, marketing copy, whatever it may be. Just give me a couple, like a two or three word response, put it in the chat window, and we're going to, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this as we go forward. I'm, I'm going to ask the team to preserve those for us, and when we get toward the end, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what those challenges are. So let me tell you why we're doing this. 
I'm a writer. It's what I do for a living. I have more than 80 books on the market. It's a very bad habit. And as a result, as you can probably imagine, writing to me is important. It's something I enjoy doing. I mean, I, I write because I love to write. I'm, I'm less concerned with the subject matter and much more concerned with the craft of putting together writing that flows nicely. The reason we're doing this is because writing, your writing, is a big element that is integral to your personal and professional brand. It's part of your image. And today more than ever, now that we're kind of in this lockdown mode where we are being forced to write more than we ever have before, it could never have been more important. You know, if your writing is hard to understand or if it's confusing or if it goes on and on and on and on and on, or if it's not, not verbose enough, that's how you're gonna be perceived. And I've noticed just in the last couple of months that this is something that is more common than we probably like to think about. And so more than ever before, you know, we can't afford this. This is really crucial. So what I want to talk about today is a little bit more with regard to things to avoid and things to do in your business writing. Like, let me give you a few facts for us to think about. The first one is that the average office worker, the average person who spends time in front of a computer, spends between 12 and 15 hours a week reading and composing and responding just to email messages. And now with COVID, that number is even higher because there's a higher percentage of, of messages, the dependency, if you will, on email as a mode of communications for us. Now, those numbers don't include the time people spend writing letters, writing blogs, writing video scripts, you know, white papers, uh, LinkedIn posts, whatever it may be. So it's actually significantly higher than that, which means it's also significantly higher opportunity to not write well, or conversely, to be perceived well. Here's the other fact. Most workers don't bother to really seriously think through what they're writing, pause before they hit click, and proofread what it is they're sending, especially in the world of emails. And you all know this. When you take a combination of the fact that we're a very mobile society where we're writing on a chiclet keyboard on a tiny little screen, you know, the concept of proofreading a message like that, even a text message, seems silly. In fact, it's not silly at all. The fact is that if you don't grab the reader in the first couple of seconds, the chances of them continuing to read go down precipitously. And this is a fact. The reason that's a problem is because what they will say to themselves is, I'm just going to set that one aside. I'll read it later. No, they won't. They'll never get around to it. It's going to get dropped lower and lower and lower in the queue, and they actually will never read it, which means that your potential for impact just went out the window. So this business writing thing, I know people talk about it all the time. What I'm going to ask you to do today as we go through this is think about your own writing in terms of the things we're talking about and think about how you might apply some of these things to, to your own world of, of communications. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about, you know, sort of the, you know, writer beware here for just a moment. When we start to talk about things like effective communications and the need to, to be clear and the need to think through what we're writing and read it to ourselves, even out loud, as silly as that sounds, um, we start to realize that, first of all, it doesn't take as much time as we think. Second, it's really an important step in the process of organizational communications. Again, especially at a time when we don't have the benefit of face-to-face -face communications, where we can sit across a table or sit across a meeting room and, and have the advantage of things like body language and you know, eye contact and so on. So this is really, really crucial for us. The other challenge we face is that our mobile lifestyles, what we often refer to as skip and scan reading, lead us to output, if you will, written output that is not well thought out. You know, we write it quickly. I, I cannot tell you how many times someone has said to me, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to proofread, but I really don't have time. Um, well, then you probably shouldn't bother to write it at all if that's the case, because chances are there are errors in it and, and you know, it's, it's going to have a bad impact. I write all the time. I, I proofread everything. In fact, when I write, if I write a book, for example, uh, the average number of times that I do a complete rewrite because I'm proofreading is 31. I've written enough books that I actually know the number. I average 31 rewrites of every manuscript I put together. 
and I constantly find errors. Even books that have been published, I continue to find errors in them and correct them. So this is, it's just human. It's part of, it's part of our, our psyche. It's part of our vision, part of a lot of different things. You can't afford to have that happen too much, right? Clarity is your friend. Remember that the only reason you're writing is to compel someone to take some action or to communicate information to them. So if you don't take the time to ensure that you're doing that in a clear, concise, easy to understand and easy to act upon fashion, then you know, you're doing yourself and them a disservice. You're basically wasting your time. So whether you're writing an email to someone or you're writing marketing copy or you're putting together a sales pitch, it doesn't matter. Take the time to really go through it. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking at what some of these things are, kind of explaining how they hang together, what the issues are, and so on. Let's talk a little bit about writing errors. All right, there are three key things here that, that we wanna focus on. I have, a, I have a very close friend, a guy that I've known since 1981. We actually started working together on the same day uh, with a company in California. And his name is Ken Sato. And Ken has been my editor from day one. And the reason I use Ken as my editor, besides the fact that, that he's a, a voracious reader, he's great with language, and uh, he's willing to do it, is that he's also not someone who reads my material and immediately gives me a thumbs up saying, this is great. Um, he's one of those people that will read it. He will tell me when it's great. He will also tell me when I'm an idiot for even thinking about publishing this the way it looks. Uh, I often joke about the fact that Ken edits with a 55 gallon drum of red ink and a paint roller, because that's pretty much what my manuscripts look like when they come back from him. And I am grateful for every square centimeter of red on the pages because he really takes the time and he really finds the things that need to be at least looked at. I may not agree with all of them, but I certainly look at them all. The first one that I want to talk about is just fundamentally weak writing, right? that there are all kinds of opportunities to, to write in a weak way, if you will. And so what I tell everyone is that you should see yourself as a literary assassin. Your job should be to seek out and destroy anything that weakens your message because it's got too many words in it or because we're using the wrong kinds of words. So verbs that end in ing, you should do everything in your power to reduce those. And I'll talk about each one of these in a second. Prepositions tend to be overused. And we use a lot of helper verbs. So I, you know, I wrote a couple of things down here that I'll just I'll talk a little bit about. You know, when we say something like, he is going to be here for the meeting, that's way too many words. How about he'll be here? I have always hated. How about just I hate? You don't need that helper have verb in there. Okay. We often say when we talk about prepositions, we often say, he looked up at the sky. Well, where else is he gonna look for the sky? I mean, it's up there. You don't need the word up in there. That's an extra word that adds an empty calorie, get rid of it, all right? The sun shone brightly. Well, that's because the sun doesn't shine darkly. You don't need that word in there. Either the sun shined or the sun was bright, pick one. And again, I realize I'm sounding a little bit picky here, but you will be astonished how different your language, your writing sounds when you take the time to be picky yourselves and remove some of this stuff. The fact is, as I'm going to prove to you in a little while, everybody tends to start to sound the same way when they write. So anything you can do to not sound like everybody else means that you're going to rise above the noise. And that's what you want, right? That's exactly what you want. You can't stand out if you're making an effort to blend in. You've got to stand out. And one of the ways to do that is by taking action to reduce the issues you have with your language. Um, here's another one for you. We, we have a tendency to rely too much on what Microsoft Word is capable of doing. I call this the Jurassic Park effect. Just because we could make dinosaurs doesn't mean we necessarily should. And we know that they shouldn't because there are at least four sequels to the original movie. Microsoft Word has a zillion features in it that make it very possible for you to take your first draft, right and left justify it, select a stunningly beautiful font, space the lines at 1.15, put a little bit of bold and italic and underline in there to make it look really good, et voila. Fini. No, it's not finished. It's still a first draft. 
it's a pretty first draft, but it's still full of every error that was in it in the first place. And here's the problem. You may not see them because the document looks so pretty, but your reader is going to see them. So just because Microsoft Word can do those things doesn't necessarily mean that you should use them because you're going to find that they have a tendency to hide things. We call it a first draft as opposed to just a draft because there's an implication that there's at least a second draft and possibly a third. And again, this is one of those things that we cannot afford to be lazy about. We have to take the time to look at our work after we've written it, accept the fact that it's a first draft and therefore it has errors in it, and now take the extra couple of minutes you need to go through it, find those errors, and fix them before you continue onward, okay? This is a really important and really, really critical piece. And this is important, you know, Mark Twain, I love this quote from Mark Twain. He said, you know, substitute the word damn every time you're inclined to write very. Your editor will delete them, and your writing will be as it should be. And he's, of course, 100% right. All right, here's another one. Uh, this is a, a variation on a theme, but nevertheless, it, it is thematic and it is important. And that is that you wanna do everything in your power to bring together extra bodies, if you can, to look at your work. I use Ken Sato, my wife always reviews my stuff. Both of them are more than willing to look at my stuff and say, with all the love in my heart, it's awful. You need to rewrite this piece. And while it's not comfortable to hear that, it's important to hear that. That's part of being, being a writer, okay? So you wanna use as many sets of objective eyes as you reasonably can on your, on your work, because if you don't, it's a failure to proofread. And when you fail to proofread, if you don't take the time to do it, you're actually showing disrespect to your reader. By taking the time to proofread your work, you're saying to the reader, I took the time to write this well so that you can understand it by reading it once. And that's a crucial thing. Okay, let's talk about punctuation for just a second, All right? Again, I know this sounds silly, but the number of errors that I see every single day in emails and in written material that people send me in the form of a, of a Word document is breathtaking. I mean, and I mean that seriously. And, and I realize I'm being a pain here because I'm a writer. It's what I do for a living. But, but this is important. And again, this is part of your brand. Okay, so let's talk about the period first. Okay, period means hard stop. It means you've come to an end of an idea and you've put a period there saying, okay, take a breath. In just a second, I'm going to move on to something else that's important. Periods and commas are often used by people almost interchangeably. And it's confusing because the comma is not a hard stop. The comma is slow down, take a breath. I'm about to introduce a new idea that's related to the prior idea or I'm separating things in a list. Either one is fine, but they're very, very different. And I'm gonna read you a couple of really good examples. My favorite example of <clears throat> what can happen when people fail to use commas appropriately, occurred on the cover of a, of a magazine. And I can, I can give you the name of the magazine if you're interested, but this was a magazine that had a cover story on it about Rachel Ray, the, the famous television chef. And Rachel Ray has a big family and, and you know, her family's important to her. And what, this, what this, this cover story said, had a big picture of her in her kitchen and in great big letters that were about an inch tall, the cover said, Rachel Ray finds inspiration in cooking her family and her dog. Well, you know, a couple of commas would have made this correct. Because what it should have said, of course, is Rachel Ray finds inspiration in cooking, comma, her family, comma, and her dog. But the lack of a couple of commas on the cover of a major magazine turned Rachel Ray from a respected chef into a cannibal. Here's another one. This came from an, an article that I actually found uh, reading a, an, uh, in a magazine about country music. Among those interviewed were Merle Haggard's two ex-wives, Chris Christopherson and Robert Duvall. Well, you know, the addition of the comma that was missing would have made the statement more accurate, but nowhere near as entertaining. I'm pretty sure Merle Haggard wasn't married to Chris Christopherson and Robert Duvall. I mean, th these are the kind of things that happen that grab people's attention because they're funny, but here's the problem with funny. The minute you pull somebody's attention away from your writing because it's funny, you just lost the opportunity to influence them with whatever serious thing it was you were trying to say, okay? So this is crucial. Let's move on and talk about semicolons and colons, okay? So 
Semicolons and colons, again, are often used kind of interchangeably, but they actually do very different things. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of these. The semicolon is used when whatever follows the semicolon relates to what came before. Okay, let me read you an example. Muppets are always quite colorful. In fact, most kids' characters are on television. Okay, so you can see that the second idea, most kids' characters are also colorful, had nothing to do with Muppets per se, but it was related to the comment about Muppets. Now let's look at the colon. The colon is kind of different. The colon says that whatever follows the colon expands on what was before the colon. So here's the difference. Muppets are always quite colorful. Big Bird, for example, is bright yellow. So you can see that that second part of the, of the sentence, separated by the semicolon, relates directly to the thing that came before by expanding on whatever idea about Muppets it was that we were trying to make. Okay? Okay, next thing, apostrophes. Another thing that is, is misunderstood and badly used in a lot of business writing. Apostrophes are used for a variety of things. Um, they're used for contractions, to turn the word it, the two words it is into its, or that is into that's. That's a good thing for it. The second area that apostrophes are used for is when you're trying to create a comment that says this is a possessive. So Pam's car, Keisha's house. In that case, the, the first word can have an, an, an apostrophe in it. Where apostrophes go horribly wrong is when people use them for plurals. When somebody writes, there are many dogs on the street today, dogs should not have an apostrophe in it, and yet it's amazing to me how often, in fact, they do. So again, this is just one of those picky things that will make your business writing stand out at a time when writing is, is sort of taking center stage with a spotlight on it in your ability to influence others. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about a, an example or two about email, all right? Why do we send email? Well, there's actually a couple of reasons why we send email. The first one is to provide updated information about something that you're trying to, to work on. The second reason is to drive a decision or an action by the person that's receiving the email. So there's a couple of things you can do to ensure that, number one, your email doesn't get put into the I'll read it later list, and number two, to ensure that it gets opened at all. The first one, of course, is the subject line. As silly as it sounds, let's talk about the subject line. The subject line should have something written in it that says why they should open the message, not what the message contains. That's why the message is there. You want to give people a reason to open it by stating something about the action required as a result of them receiving this email. It should include some kind of an action verb, a time, and perhaps a question, okay? Then we get into the body of the, of the email. Bodies should always contain concise messages, and one of the best ways to do that is to use bullets and really short paragraphs. Okay, remember, we're talking about skip and scan readers here. If you put up, a, if you put up a, an email that has a long paragraph in it, as I'll show you in a moment, they're never gonna get through it because they're trying to find the message in the paragraph, but they have to go through all this verbiage to get to that point. So because we're talking about people who have the attention span generally of a gnat, don't babble. Here's what I want to tell you, boom, and you tell them. And what bullets force you to do is to be really concise and to focus the important things that you're trying to communicate on the, on the person that's receiving the message. Let me give you an example. Here's an email that I wrote to a friend of mine to, to demonstrate sort of what happens when you have this avalanche of words coming at you in an email. So look at the subject line, first of all, quick message. Well, that's helpful, right? Now look at the body. One long, uninterrupted, hard to read paragraph. I mean, I'm looking at this and my eyes are scanning all over the paragraph trying to find something important in it, but you don't. So you can imagine that someone is gonna take this and because I didn't say anything in the subject line about it being important, they'll say, well, maybe after lunch, I'll get around to it. Here's what that email should have looked like. 
subject line recommendations for the technology seminar. And then look what I did down below. I broke it up into pieces. So the first paragraph, which is two lines only, says, I read over your comments. Here are the actions I believe we should take. And then a bullet list. Assign the discussion points, design breakout sessions, prepare current strategy, take time to give managers an overview, bang, bang, bang. And look at the very last line. Please get back to me with your thoughts by noon tomorrow so that I have time to make the changes. You see the difference? As silly as this seems, going from this to this makes all the difference. Again, it's about personal brand. It's about being seen as someone who conveys information that's easy to understand and that can be gone through quickly so that a decision can be made quickly. So let's talk about the famous best practices for, uh, for email. First of all, you know, think about who you're talking to because email can take on a variety of different sort of tones. If it's someone you know really well, you can be a little bit more friendly, a little bit less professional than someone who is not necessarily in your social circle, all right? So you wanna be very careful about choosing the level of professionalism and conversational style that you use in your emails. And since emails have become such a critical form of our, of our organizational communications techniques, this is one of those things that we really wanna think about and think about pretty carefully, okay? The second one is, is email the right choice? I mean, would it be easier just to pick up the phone and call the person? I know that we don't do that much anymore. I'm still amazed that we actually call them cell phones because we rarely use the phone part of the device. But the fact is that sometimes the email is just, is just the least efficient way to reach out to someone, okay? And then the third point I wanna make here, and this is an important point, is that you wanna think through what you're doing. You wanna think about what you're writing before you write it. And then what you want to do is you want to read it after you write it and you want to read it again. And before you do that, when you're really comfortable with it, now you can click to send. Okay. And again, I know I'm being picky here, but this is important. All right. How well do you know this person? Have you picked the right tone? Have you used bullets? Is the email structured properly? And so on. These are the kind of things that you really want to think about hard. Okay. One more thing, and this is something that is very important to me personally, and it's something because I spend a lot of time in the technology world that I, I talk about a lot, and that is this. If your writing looks like this, if your speaking looks like this, if you are routinely talking about how much better it is when you want to optimize the situation, especially in the key metrics of an ecosystem, where you want to have one throat to choke because there are so many moving parts. And since we're all on a burning platform with a bleeding edge, we need to find a magic bullet that will help us put skin in the game. What I'd like you to do, if you don't mind, please, is stand in front of a mirror in your bathroom and slap yourself really hard in the face three times and then do it again. You remember earlier when I said everybody sounds the same? Well, this is what I'm talking about. In the world of business, we have a tendency to adopt these droning phrases that initially have meaning, but in fact, over time, they start to be just noise. And if you wanna be a purveyor of noise, that's fine, you go do that. But in fact, if you would like to be a little bit more sort of, um, how do I say this, focused, something, more along the lines of a person that people actually want to listen to. Do everything in your power to eliminate these phrases from your language. Okay. This is something everybody does. Remember earlier when I said, if you want to stand out, you can't be part of the crowd. Well, this is how you stand out. Sound different than everybody else. These words, like I said earlier, these are extra calories. They're empty calories. They add nothing to the conversation. You know, it's a kind of a fun exercise. Look at this list of phrases, pick one, and try to figure out how you would say it in plain everyday English, right? Kind of an interesting exercise. So if I, if I said something like one throat to choke, how would you say that without saying one throat to choke? You'd be amazed how different you will sound, okay? All right, so let's, uh, 
let's summarize this and then I want to go to our comments that we asked you to put into the uh, that you asked to put into the uh, chat window. Step number one. These are important points that I'd like you to think about as you go forward. One is to read. If you want to be a better writer, one of the best ways to do that is by becoming a better reader. I read a lot. It's part of my job. Uh, I, I'm in the technology world for the most part, do a lot of strategy work, and I find that reading a wide variety of things helps me to do that job much better. More importantly, it helps me become a better writer. I learn how different people write, but even more important than that, what it allows me to do is to develop my writing skills so that I learn how to use language properly and so on. So that's important. The second thing I want to talk about is writing. Obviously, like any craft, like any skill, the more you write, the better you become at it. But I want to go one step further here. And that is, when I say write, if you're writing something important, if you're writing a letter, you know, not a brief email necessarily, but if you have to write a long email to someone, it's got a lot of information in it, and it's important, or you're writing a white paper, or you're writing a letter to someone that's important, write it by hand first. Now, I know this is a radical thought, but let me tell you why I recommend this. Writing by hand forces you to slow down because you don't write as quickly as you type. And when it forces you to slow down, you will be amazed how much more creative your writing becomes. As you write a word and realize it's the wrong word, so you scratch it out and write something different, the fact that you're taking the time to write it by hand will actually make the finished product better because you can then take that written thing and transcribe it into whatever word processor or email system you're using. Every book I write, every article I write, and I write hundreds of them every year, is written by hand first, 100% of the time. And it makes it remarkably better in the final analysis, okay? The third thing I want to talk about is what I call seek and destroy. And this is something we talked about on an earlier slide. Seek and destroy basically means look for all of those places where your writing sounds weak. And folks, if you want to try a little experiment on how to do this, pick, pick something you've written. And before you send it, go into a room by yourself, close the door and read it out loud to yourself. And I'm serious about this. This is something, by the way, that radio broadcasters do all the time. They read their copy to themselves out loud before they actually say it because they identify things that they don't hear in their mind when they're reading it silently. Try that, okay? Proofread everything. We already said that several times. Think before you click, of course. Be a jargon assassin. Eliminate it. It's unnecessary. Be wary of things like three-letter acronyms. Get rid of them as much as you can. Just because you know them doesn't mean your audience does. Here's another thing. We are taught to write somewhat um, formally in school, and that's fine, except that it isn't necessarily the best way to communicate with other human beings. So write naturally, write the way you speak, but do it in a clean fashion. You know, write it out, clean it up before you publish it. And then, especially in the world of email, use spaces and use bullets as much as you possibly can, okay? All right. So with that, we're to the end here. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to see some of the things that people said about their challenges with writing. So let me, I brought up the list here and I'd, I'd actually like to just speak to these a little bit. This is kind of interesting. So the, one of the first ones says, you know, formatting the subject. What are key considerations for an attention grabbing subject? Well, this is a really good question. And it's, it, it is actually critical because remember, this is where you have just a couple of seconds to grab their attention. In fact, many years ago, Carol Moore, who was the very first webmaster for IBM Corporation, back when there were three websites on the planet, literally three, and IBM was one of them, she once made the observation that the time that you have, that a website has to grab a viewer's attention is eight inches, I'm sorry, 10 inches wide, eight inches tall, and two seconds long, referring to the amount of time that they will look at a screen of information before they either stay or click away. And the same is true here. The subject should contain something that is important to the receiver of the message, not something that is important to you. 
And I know that that seems counterintuitive, but in point of fact, that's exactly what it should be. You want to say something to this person that will cause them to take action or that will cause them to respond in some way. And the only, re the only way they will do that is if what you have written, what you have said has a strong what's in it for me element. So for example, formatting the subject to say something like um, um, needed preparation for tomorrow's webinar or uh, critical information for tomorrow's meeting. Something that will grab their attention that means, oh, I better look at this because this could mean the difference between me appearing, you know, positively or negatively with the audience. So, so a variety of ways to do that. The second one says, you know, my biggest challenge is to be brief, accurate and effective without turning people off because I have to influence people. And I think that's a really good point because here's what happens. Um, we have a tendency oftentimes to write the way we speak. And I just told you a couple of slides ago that actually that's what I want you to do. But I only want you to do that to a point because obviously we speak somewhat more sloppily than we should write. Okay. It, it's kind of funny. I do a lot of podcasting for my clients as well as a public podcast that I produce. And, you know, I, I took a lot of classes on language and literature because, you know, I became a writer. And I was taught to write a very specific way, you know, don't use contractions, you know, use entire words and be formal and all those things that we all learned in grammar classes in high school and, and junior high school. And when I started, um, when I started broadcasting, when I started doing podcasts, for example, I had to unlearn a lot of what I, a lot of what I knew. And the reason was that when we speak, we tend to use a lot of contractions because it sounds normal and natural. If we don't use them when we speak, we sound oftentimes kind of pompous and bloated and nobody wants to sound that way. So I had to go through this painful process of being able to switch back and forth between two writing styles, depending on whether I was formulating a, a script for a podcast or I was putting together an email or a business letter. And one of the manifestations of that was that in my writing, not for podcasts, but for traditional business stuff, I had to learn to prune the tree a little bit. I had to think about what is the key message I'm trying to deliver? How do I state that in one sentence? And then is there anything I need to follow it with in the way of either bullets or an additional paragraph that modifies it to give the person that's receiving it a little bit of extra information so that I can accelerate their ability to make a decision quickly? Okay, critical. Are contractions acceptable for business emails? 100% of the time, unless you've got someone you're writing to who is a little bit more formal or, and this is a critical one, and I've found this to be the case, I do a lot of work internationally, sometimes if you're writing to someone for whom English is a second language, you may find that contractions create a distraction or difficulty. So you want to think a little bit about who you're writing to. That's a special case. But sometimes what you'll find is that a contraction can actually be something they don't necessarily understand. And so, you know, you want to expand the word in that particular case. But yes, contractions are fine for business emails. Why should the writer bear responsibility for the reader's lack of time or discipline? Well, it's a good question. And, you know, it's easy to argue this both ways. And I actually like this question. This is an interesting one. The, the answer is because if your job is to put information into that person's hands that will cause them to take an action that benefits you, then even though it's a pain, it's, it is in your best interest to do so. That's the only reason you would do that. Obviously, you know, you can't change the way this person operates, but you know, we all know people who are overwhelmed and if they're overwhelmed, then they're going to run into a situation where they have a hard time dealing with the number of emails they get either because they're bad at organization or they are simply overloaded. Right. So anything you can do benefits you. Anything you can do to kind of reduce that is a good thing. OK, um, you know, is it helpful to use Grammarly? Yeah, I, I actually like Grammarly. I don't rely on it exclusively or 100 percent of the time because like any tool, it's just a tool. Um, but I use it sometimes as a second as a second set of eyeballs to check out, okay? And, it, and it's, worth, uh, it's worth looking at. Here's another interesting recommendation for you. It just occurred to me. Many, many years ago, uh, Deloitte actually paid a company to create an application. And the application is still available on the web. I don't think it works on the Mac environment. I could be wrong there, but it does work in the PC environment. And it's a plugin for applications like Word and other word processors, and it's called Bullfighter. And what Bullfighter does is it seeks out and identifies jargon, 
or language that is not as clear as it should be, and it points it out to you. So you might want to just for fun, see if you can find a copy of Bullfighter online and, and just give it a try. I, I used it for years. I had it loaded on my machine and it was pretty good. Okay, how to write an email to an audience that includes finance, R&D, and regulatory. Okay, one of the programs that we deliver at Emory in, in the business school in Goizeta is a, is a program on business storytelling. I know that sounds silly, but storytelling is a critical part of human interaction. It's critical. And here's the deal. Um, one of the lessons we teach people is that if you try to make your story work for everybody, it will work for nobody. Okay? And so you've got to do a little bit of tuning. Now, the fact is that finance, R&D, and regulatory often have some commonality of purpose among them. I work with all three of these folks, these kinds of organizations on a fairly regular basis in the telecom and IT worlds. And the key is, and this is the hard part of your job, is to identify what that common thing is. That, in other words, can you write at a level that is going to work for all three domains? So for example, you know, regulatory often has a very interesting relationship with R&D, okay? And because it's R&D, what ends up happening is that, you know, they're interested in funding to allow them to continue to do development and research and so on, but that brings finance into the equation. So that would be an interesting kind of thematic direction you could take to make sure that all three of these are being used properly, okay? These are great. These are really good questions, folks. What techniques do you use? It's kind of an interesting one right, to uh, ensure that you have the correct tone from the reader's point of view, so that the reader doesn't perceive the email as rude, bossy, etc. Ah, yes, indeed. Well, of course, one of the things you want to do is you want to know your audience as much as you possibly can. Now, sometimes you don't, right? So in a situation like that, what you want to do is you want to be um, not formal per se, but not completely informal either, and you want to be simply clear and polite. Don't try to be flowery. Don't try to make it a conversation. Just make your point. Thank you for reading. Please get back to me by this time. Based on the response you get from that person, you may well get an idea of sort of personality-wise who they are. Is this someone that you can, in fact, be a little bit fun with, or do you have to maintain that really kind of serious, get to the point kind of tone because maybe they're a type A and you want to make sure that you don't waste their time or, or feel like you're wasting their time or give them that impression. Okay. These are the kind of questions folks that, that I was hoping to get because these are the kind of things that come up all the time in, in business communications. And we honestly just don't know how to deal with them. How do you create a comprehensive communications when there are varying levels of base knowledge? You've got to go to one of two things. Remember what I said earlier about storytelling. You either have to send different emails to different constituencies, or you have to find a common base of knowledge that gives everybody what you need them to know at a low level, and then let them come back to you with requests for additional information if they want it. So for example, in that situation when we were talking about finance and R&D and regulatory, the regulatory people probably will have different questions in response to your email than the people in finance. That's fine as long as you give them the key message that says, I need a decision about this and I need it now. Now we've got an answer. And that's, that's kind of important to the way we look at that. Okay. All right. Let's see. Last one, I think. <clears throat> what are my favorite closings for ending of an email? Ah, uh, good question. All my love. It's always a good one to go with. What are your favorite closings? Well, again, it's going to depend on the audience, and you're going to have to think of, think this through. If, if you're dealing with a multinational audience, there's a couple of things you can end with. If you're just trying to end it in a friendly fashion, uh, cheers is always popular, and it's always acceptable. Everywhere in the world, if you say cheers, in fact, even in multiple languages, you can say that, and people will accept it. Okay, that's critical. Um, the other possibility, of course, is if it's someone you know, you might want to end, and I mean truly know them. It's someone you've worked with for a long time. They may not be a friend, but they're a close colleague at a client organization or whatever. You know, it's always nice to end with a, with a personal note. You know, hope your family is well. You know, hope, hope every, everything is good. Hope you manage to get away for a little bit this summer, whatever it may be, and then end it from there. But, but just be judicious about that. Think about it. Okay. And then the last one I want to speak to is this one, you know, how can I help my organization understand the importance of what I'm saying? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, 
first of all, I'm happy to share with you a, a little short paper and a podcast that I put together about this stuff. Um, and my friends at Emory have these and I'll make sure that they have the most current versions that kind of speak to why this stuff is important. And I'll put those in your hands so that you can use them. And, and, and of course, like all of us at Emory, feel free to get a hold of me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to work with you, um, you know, just to offer you advice or even proofread something if you've got something you'd like me to look at. I'm happy to do that for you. You know, that's part, that's part of what we do here. I'm glad to do that. But the most important thing is that, and this again comes from the world of storytelling, don't tell them, show them. This is really important. We have a tendency in business to say to a group of people that we're trying to influence, you need to do this. This is important, you need to do this. But there's nothing in that message that says why. There's no what's in it for me. It comes down as a mandate. And as humans, because we know how to think, we tend to resist mandates. Instead, what you wanna do is say, let me show you the difference between these two documents. Which one do you like? They will invariably pick the one that has been edited and proofread and is more carefully and concisely written. And then you can make your point about, we need to teach people how to do this. This is critical. Then you can go forward from there. So I am going to shut up because you've heard enough of my voice now. And I'm going to turn this back to my colleagues and peers on the other side of the ether here and ask them where we go from here. Thank you all, all for your attention here. Like I said, I'll make sure that we've got some resources available to you that you're welcome to take. And um, let me ask if my friends on the other side have any other questions they'd like me to respond to. Yes, thank you so much, Steve. This was great, great information. Uh, we do have a couple of comments and questions in the chat box we uh, wanna get to sure. um, in the last couple of minutes. Um, one of the comments states, um, our team of mental health professionals is very relational and feelings oriented. Business writings uh, kind of feel cold to their staff, and pre-COVID, email was not their primary way of communicating with each other. Yeah. So can you speak to, since they're in isolation now, um, what are more ways that they can connect personally um, in their writing styles? That's a, oh boy, what a great question that is. Um, it's funny, I do a lot of work in healthcare and, and this has come up more than once. And, and I'll, I'll tell you the recommendation I made off the top of my head to a group, actually it was a group here in Vermont, a critical care group that I've done some work with. Um, and it came right off the top of my head and they implemented it and they've, they've told me that it works brilliantly. And so whoever's asking this question, feel free to send me an email and I'll, I'll give you more information about how I did this. But basically what I said to them was this, um, you, uh, you need to communicate now using email more than you ever have before, but email we all know can be rather impersonal. So here's what I recommend you do. Um, if you've got a message to give to somebody, record it. Your phone comes with a recorder, record it. And then send the recording as an attachment in an email. Do that three or four times. And then phase two is rather than send the voice, the little voice attachment, which you don't have to do, uh, but it works, take your recording and transcribe it into email, just the way you said it. And your email will magically become much more friendly, much more human, much more approachable. Now, the immediate question that's on some of your minds is, well, why don't you just leave a voicemail? And the answer is because most of us perceive voicemail as impersonal. For some weird, inexplicable reason, when I attach a voice file to an email, there is a perception that I took a little extra time to do this. I did, but not much. And it's taken in a more friendly, acceptable, acceptable way. And I know it sounds bizarre, but give it a shot and see if that helps. And then I have some other things that I'm happy to share with you that might, that might be useful. How's that? Thank you, Steve. Um, question has come in uh, from one of our participants that said she's noticed emails are starting to include wording in the subject line, such as your action is required or follow up requested. Is this effective and appropriate? It is as long as it's, and I, this is going to sound silly, it is as long as it's sent to the right person. Um, one of the things that, that happens in, in, uh, in email is that, that oftentimes the subject line is so obtuse that we don't realize it's something that we're supposed to act on. Um, and, so, and so anything you can do in that subject line to make it clear to the other side that they should respond to it is a good thing. Now, 
as we often say, there are ways and there are ways, right? You, you don't have to be you don't have to be terse and almost dismissive in the tone, um, but wording it in a way that makes it clear to the other person that that I'm sending this to you because I need your response on it, you know, without seeming demanding, but it's, it's the needs of the business. I need your help here. You know, something like that can make all the difference in terms of how quickly they respond to it and how seriously they take the, the intended message that you're sending. Hope that makes sense. It does, Steve, thank you so much. Um, and a, a lot of the other comments and final comments, I think we've got time to address um, maybe one more question, sure. but they're all around um, helping their organization to kind of understand the importance of what they're saying, getting their point across, being succinct in their messaging. Um, lots of comments, um, lots of love in the chat box as well. Um, so in your final comments, um, please feel free to share uh, and address any of those um, comments that we've just noted. Yeah, so let, 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 me, let me say this, okay? Um, because we have technology at our disposal readily, we tend to rely on it a little bit too much. And what I mean by that is that we tend to use voicemail, email, and other forms of communications, texting, social media, as a replacement for human to human communications. Now, right now we have to, unfortunately, because of the situation that we're all in, but it's not the same. And so anything you can do to make your communications with other people more human, more interactive, is gonna work in your favor. So for example, um, I know that I'm suggesting something really, really radical here, but just go with me for a second pick up the phone and call somebody. You know, we tend not to do that for reasons I honestly don't understand, but call them, let them hear your voice. Do a Zoom call with them just to do a Zoom call with them, just to say hi, just to be personal, like running into somebody in the hallway coming back from getting coffee. It has a huge impact. Here's another thing, I write letters to people. I mean, I pick up my fountain pen, I'm a fountain pen guy, I write letters. And the reason I do it is because it's attention getting. First of all, they're people I care about. I write them a letter or a note by hand that says, hey, I just want you to know I'm thinking about you. And the feedback I get is that it's not so much what you said in the letter, it's the fact that you took the time to sit down with me in mind and write a personal note. And I do this with my clients as much as I do with my friends. And it's not intended to be, you know, sneaky or subversive at all. I care about these people and I want them to know that I that in a time when we don't have interpersonal communications, here's a way to do it. I would recommend that you give that a shot. And finally, when we use the tools that we have, keep in mind one fundamentally important thing. Whether it's a telephone or your email system or texting or any form of communications that involves electrons and bits. Keep in mind that those electrons and bits, those systems stand between you and the person you're communicating with. Keep in mind that the telephone network, the largest machine ever built, is still there to do something that is inferior to its intended goal, which is to replace human communications from one person to another. So anything you can do to make your communication clear, concise, human, friendly, and open is going to work in your favor. And like I said, I have a lot of resources on this stuff that I'm happy to share with anybody that's interested. Um, and just all you have to do is reach out to us and we'll get it to you. Thanks, folks. I appreciate your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve. This has been just an excellent refresher today. Even myself, I was over here taking notes. So <laughs> I appreciate it this morning. And we, of course, appreciate you all, our wonderful audience that joins us every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. for the Business Over Breakfast webinar series. 